going, everybody? I wanted to make a kind of a, I don't like doing this because I tend to think that I'd probably put, you know, if, if, if uh, people know, I don't do scripts but in my video. Um, I just kind of think of a topic to talk about and I just talk about it. Idiot with a loud exhaust. So I wanted to make this follow-up video, I guess, and I just, just uh, got finished uh, adding the um, video about the being a legal aid in prison. <laughs> There's a few things that, that I think are very important um, for people to understand. And that is that prisoners are people that are in prison. It's a pretty self-explanatory concept, and I'm not trying to be silly when I talk here, but, but that's, that's all they are. Um, they're, they're sons, mothers, brothers, fathers, they're people. And, and when you attach labels to people, then throughout the course of history, it's done a lot of bad things. Um, certain racial epithets and, and ethnic pejoratives and, and other stuff that doesn't tend to lead to anything good. The only purpose it can have is to serve to dehumanize that, that person or that group of people. And the same thing applies to prisoners. And I can tell you from my experience that when you are called inmate, it has an effect on you. I've been out since 2015, and it's October of 2020. Hearing that, still saying that, still has has an effect, you know, on me, and, and I'm sure it has an effect on people that are that are in custody or that that uh, have been in custody before in the past. Um, I think a lot of people, for lots of reasons, they tend to lose sight and and lose contact with their relatives that are in prison. And that's a bad thing, um, whether it's because of the ex ex exorbitant, hugely inflated cost of phone calls or the unpredictable and unreliable mail system that exists in prison. The fact that everything is screened and your letter or that perfume card that you send to your boyfriend or girlfriend or whoever is subject to getting confiscated for any number of no reasons whatsoever. Um, and those are all allowed, that and more. When when. You know, there's there's cases that I've read. And I was trying to look for the case just a minute ago. I couldn't find it, but I, I've heard in in more than one case where prisons are called constitutional black holes, and that's really you can see why because when you when you're a sentenced person, when you're in prison, when you're in custody for a, a, a lawful sentence, whether you're claiming you're innocent or whether you're guilty or, or not, it doesn't matter. Society and, and the courts have specifically said we're going to leave our noses out of out of out of prisons. They're free to run the, their places how they want to, pretty much as long as no one's dying on a grand scale. And even when that happens, it seems like the courts don't want to get involved. Um, so when you have someone that goes to prison, doesn't and there's been other cases. Uh, Thurgood Marshall uh, said that uh, just because the doors of a penitentiary close behind you doesn't mean that your human wishes for um, that you know realization and, and, and other needs go away or that you cease to become a human being, basically. And I'm very loosely paraphrasing. I'm not doing his quote justice. <laughs> but it's important because prisoners go to prison and they do their time. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's people that get forgotten about. Their family that can't get a hold of them. And then you're subject to people. There are some prison guards that I met that would make fine police officers. And there's some prison guards that I've met that would make fine bulls in a ring. And that's about all they're good for because they're either totally dispassionate about anything because they have their own psychotic issues because they're, they're a female that's, and I've seen this, they're a female that's there for the sheer purpose of being ogled because she doesn't look that great in society, but in prison, she's an eight or a nine or a 10 and, you know, in society, she's a one or a two at best, and that's what beer goggles on. You know what I'm saying? So you have to remember the kind of people that are there. They typically, as a whole across the country, they tend to make a lot less money than the average. It doesn't require a lot of education. I'm not saying that education is everything because there's a lot of police departments and that, that don't require a lot of education. That's been changing as a whole, but corrections, because of the changeover, the turnover that they tend to have, um, they don't really pay that good. So, I mean, you get what you, what you get. Um, the one thing that I wanted to say about this is, you know, that, that prisoners, 
are people. And the, the problem that people don't want to realize is that the cases that come through prisons and that come from prisons <laughs> have a direct effect and result and consequence on people in society. And whether they see that or not, that's the reason that people need to care about prisoners and about law that comes from prison. And there's a lot of it. Um, you know, prisoners tend to be, um, you know, a lot of people don't care about the law until they have to, right? You know, until they get into court or until they get in a situation where they have to learn the law, they don't get into it. But once you get into it and you learn what that can do, um, and I'm not saying to manipulate it, to use it for your own reasons. I mean, if, 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 if you have something that happens and you know that it's wrong, like you're innocent, like there's an adoption that's taken away your, your rights to your child, like you're given an exorbitant fine, something like that, you know that the, the, you find out the law says that that's not okay, and you fight that and you win, then you care about law a little bit more at that point. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of cases that I've read, a lot of summaries that I've read that talk about insane, obscene abuses that prisoners go through and that pre-trial detainees go through. Um, they're kind of sourced in that same thought that someone in handcuffs, they're guilty, the cops are doing the right thing. And while I tend to believe naively, I think that a lot of times when someone's arrested that they are guilty or they're at least, there's at least you know, enough to justify that arrest, doesn't necessarily always mean they're guilty. And it certainly doesn't mean that they deserve to have any less human rights than any other person, you know, anywhere. Um, it, it um, this is, uh, I'm going to read this from the uh, Freedom Forum Institute. It's by an individual named David, uh, David Hudson Jr. And he was asked why he cares so much about prisoners' rights. And this kind of better, the, you know, my own words kind of sums up why I care about prisoners' rights. Um, I'm going to read, I'm going to quote it and put the link in the description for this video to give the proper source and citation for it. But, um, he says, first, prisoners uh, file an inordinate amount of litigation alleging deprivation of their constitutional rights. Some studies have shown that prisoners' litigation makes up more than 20% of the federal court docket. It, could be, it would be negligent not to report on at least some of these pleadings, even if many prisoner complaints leave much to be desired in terms of form and validity. Second, much deprivation of constitutional rights occurs in prisons. One attorney described prisons to me years ago as constitutional black holes. Think about it. Prisoners are under the control of the government officials 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They are bound, there are bound to be many rights violations, and he's correct in that. Um, third, principles from prisoner free expression cases often seep out and affect other areas of First Amendment law. A classic example occurred in the Supreme Court case that arose, arose in Missouri. Turner versus Safley, 1987, the Supreme Court rejected inmate Leonard Safley's claim that he had a First Amendment right to send letters to his girlfriend, later his wife who was an inmate at another prison. Though the court did uphold his right to marry her, the court created a standard for prison constitutional claims that prison officials do not violate inmates' constitutional rights if their actions are reasonably related to legitimate pedagogical, penological interests. A year later, the Supreme Court rejected the First Amendment claims of three young female student journalists in Hazelwood School District versus Kuhlmeyer. Uh, in that decision, the court applied the rule that school officials could censor student speech if their actions were reasonably related to legitimate pedag pedagogical concerns. I'm probably hacking that word all the crap, but so the the yeah the juxtaposition of the two words there. But the court simply substituted the word pedagogical and penological. While lecture on the substitute student groups, this there normally is a collective gasp. Fourth, prisoners, whatever they may have done, are still human beings worthy of some level of respect. I've quoted this many times from Thorgood Marshall. I'm gonna this is the quote that I hacked up earlier that I was thinking about. When the prison gate slam behind an inmate. He's not lose his human quality. His mind has not become closed to ideas. His intellect does not cease to feed on a free and open interchange of opinions. His yearning for self-respect does not end, nor is, he, nor is his quest for, for self-realization concluded. Um, And then he talks about some other stuff there, which is very valid. But that, 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 that's the point. That's the thing I wish people would understand is that you have groups of people that, that are generally shunned, the homeless, uh, prisoners, um, you know, looking at statistics and all those kinds of things. A lot of prisoners are subject to broken homes. They are, um, 
a lot of them are drug addicts, not all of them, but a lot of them are, have a drug past at least. And that may be the reason why they're in prison or may not be. But there's a certain, there's certainly more than likely a drug component somewhere in that history of that person. Um, and that those are health issues. Those are bigger issues than just putting someone behind a locked door. And that's obviously, see by the fact we have empty prisons and people that are still committing crimes, that prisons don't always work. And I'm not going to get into that, but I just wanted people to understand where I was coming from and, and you know, why it's so important. And it shouldn't be ignored or uh, disregarded the impact that the prison cases and um, the changes that come from, from prisoners challenging their condition of confinement or challenging their convictions. Um, no group of people, I would say, is, you know, like he said in the article there, is more controlled or monitored or scrutinized uh, than prisoners. Um, between the mail, between the phone calls that are recorded, that's generally a standard practice. You have no privacy. You're on camera 24-7. You're, you're subject to search anytime without a warrant at all times. It, it's, it's, a, it's a, a test spot for, for these kind of constitutional law cases that some people see as, a, as an agitation to society, but if the Constitution is interpreted by a court, that's, that's their job. Um, you know, basic, basic uh, civics lessons teach us that. So that's all I've got. I just want to make a quick follow-up here. It's 11 minutes. And uh, to just kind of update and talk about why uh, prison litigation and cases are, are so important and why legal aids in Kentucky especially, uh, it's, a, it's somewhat of a unique model. Other states, they do it differently. Kentucky does it the way they do it. Um, if you have any comments, please uh, leave them down below. I'll try to get back. And like, share, and subscribe. Thanks.